on vacation with uh, my wife, and, and uh, Mom was with us, and, and I think Joshua was with us. We were down at uh, Cumberland Falls. We were walking along, and we, um, I noticed, looked down and, and uh, saw a rock. And I'm not from that area. It's a rock I didn't recognize. It's a real black rock. And uh, um, I thought, I walked by it, and then I saw there were several of them. So I picked one of them up, and I said, Josh, you know, this looks like coal. And uh, it was all rounded and smooth and everything uh, from, the, from the water because we were down by the Cumberland River. And, and I took it home and I held a lighter to it and it crackled and it popped and it, and it was cold. Um, and so uh, I got to thinking about that. The Lord reminded me of it this week. That's kind of like um, going to church one a week, once a week. There's mm -hmm. stuff out there you can find on the ground. There's treasures mm -hmm. out there. Uh, another good analogy might be when the uh, when the miners would go out west in California and Utah and those areas. Come on, Janet, sit down. Um, uh, just catching people up. Um, you know, they'd pan for gold and they'd find a little bit in the stream. But when they really, you know, when they thought that there was a lot of gold there or a lot of silver there, then they would bring in the heavy equipment. They would make the investment. They would start to dig. They would dynamite. They would they would blast with high pressure water. All those kinds of things, and they would dig deep. And they would get the stuff that's really valuable. They, you know, they'd find a vein 10 feet wide, 300 feet long. Same thing with coal. Um, I know down in the mountains, some places where they cut roads through, you'll see people stomp along the road and just kind of pick the coal up that's laying there, just out on top of the ground. And they'll take it and they'll burn it. They'll heat their houses with it. Uh, but that's not where the true riches are. That's not where the great treasure is. That's not where the wealth of, of those substances are. You got to dig. You got to mine for it. You got to make the investment. And so, you all tonight, folks in Wild Around, I think we have some people in Paris, you know, you're making the investment. You're digging tonight. And that's what we're going to do. So, I just letting everybody get uh, uh, oriented tonight. I already mentioned to some folks at Distance of Campuses, this is the book we're using. Okay. And I have one actually for you. Let me get it. <laughs> If you if you you know pay to be in the course, this is the this is the textbook that goes with it. It's actually written by the guy that that has done the course, uh, Dr. Wingate, and so that's your that's your textbook to go along with the material that we're covering. So everybody, we are on page ten in in your notes, um, and I think the distance learning you also have the same set of notes that we're looking at. If you do not, uh, again, please contact the main office. Make sure we get you caught up. Um, but page ten in the notes, we are talking about. The top of the page there says five. Hey, how you doing? Doing well. New student. Yes, Year sir. Order. Yes, sir. Okay, so we we we've got people wandering around everywhere. Find a place. I and sure get will. To move over. That's fine. Thank you. Um, tell me your name. Henry. Henry Canine. Okay, Henry. I'm gonna have you sign in. All right. This is you great. Have people coming in. So, oh, you know. I have some. I don't have you're welcome. And there you go. Henry, just sign your name there. I sure will. And uh, glad to have you. Glad Thank have you. you. Glad to meet you. Let me give you a set of notes. Distance learning sites. We're just, you know, we're just doing some uh, some housekeeping here. Oh. And so for the third time, <laughs> it's all right, people <laughs> wanted it. For the third time, I know you can hear me. We are on page 10. In your notes, it's kind of where we had left off. Five infallible steps of faith. It's good to have people here. Good to be studying together. Five yeah. infallible steps of faith. Uh, now, I will tell you, these are, these are um, you're not going to find this list in Scripture anywhere. Uh, step one, meditation. Step two, illumination. Step three, the prayer of faith. Step four, confession. Step five, possession. But those are all spiritual principles. And so we have, so we have uh, Scripture aligned with them. We are actually about halfway through Part A, Step 1, Meditation, in Five Infallible Steps. And so um, we've got, we've got a, a, an amount of material that we need to go through uh, tonight. And if we go through in two sessions, great. If we go through in three sessions, fine. We're just going to, this is really some exciting things to talk about tonight. Yes. And so um, uh, uh, let's just dive right in. Part five of step one meditation is where we had left off. Some key verses in meditation. And meditation is important because we're talking about how to produce faith in our lives. Romans 10, 17, remember it says, Faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the Word of God, that's a meditation process. It's not a one-time thing. Okay? Um, and, and I told Henry, you may not know this, but, but Daniel and Janet know. I'll just get to going. You know, so if you need to stop me to ask a question, you have to flag me down. But, but, but feel free to do that. So anyway, key verse, uh, Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of, out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This is a meditation process. Now I want you to kind of, if you want to use parentheses or underline, there are three essential parts to this verse. And the first is not depart from your mouth, but meditate in it day and night. That's the first part. Not depart from your mouth, but meditate in it day and night. Amen. The second part is observe to do according to all that is written in it. That's the second part. And the third part is make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Now, I break it down into three parts for this reason. We're talking about creating faith in our lives. Faith is the currency of the kingdom of God. We've got to have faith. We want to operate in faith. People have a lot of ideas of what faith is. Uh, and then one of the reasons we're in this course is to straighten out some of those ideas and get a clear view of it. But the way this verse works, the way this makes it relevant in our lives, the way it makes it operational in our life, it's a wonderful verse. We can say, yes, amen, but I go out of here and I don't know what to do with it. We don't want that to happen. We want you to take it out of here and be able to know what to do with this verse and have it operating in your life. So the first thing, the meditation process, it says, God is speaking to Joshua. Joshua has just taken over uh, leading the kingdom of Israel. Uh, Moses has died, passed the mantle on to Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. So that means there's this constant meditating, speaking, muttering, hearing the Word of God. Yeah. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So, so the first step is he's just mulling this over in his mind. He's saying it over and over. You all got scriptures on your refrigerator or, you know, stuck up here and there or in the bathroom mirror. Why, why do we do that? Because we want them continually before our eyes. We don't want them to depart from our mouth. We want them just there all the time. So, so when you get it to that place, then what happens is step two. Observe to do according to all that is written in it. So many people, I think from, from an honest effort and being good-hearted, try to do the doing before they have the strength from the Word on the inside Amen. to do it. And really what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up for failure. Amen. Okay, So it really is a step <coughs> one. Get this thing in your mouth. Yeah. Be speaking it. Hearing it. Meditating in it day and night. Letting it drop down on the inside of you. Rest in your heart. Get planted in your heart. Uh, the good ground that the seed of faith goes into. Then when you do that, then what's going to happen is then as you have the word on the inside, you are going to be able to have and find the strength to do the word. You're not doing it on your own strength. It is doing what it is naturally designed to do. And so then as the word is flowing out of you, as faith is flowing out of you, because it's been flowing in, then the third part happens. You make your way prosperous and you have good success which is the fruit of faith, the fruit of the Word of God that's in your life. So it's three steps there. Um, Deuteronomy 30, verse 11 says, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Look at this phrase. But the Word, and what we've been talking about, Romans 10, 17, Faith comes by hearing the Word. Uh, okay. Uh, but the Word is very near you in your mouth. What, did Josh, what are we going to hear in Joshua, which is actually the next book? It does not depart from your mouth. It's you meditate in it day and night. The Word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart. What's it say here? That you may do it. I mean, we stumble terribly as Christians over and over and over because we're trying to do something that we have not taken the time to build on the inside of us. I know where you are where faith is concerned. I know where you are with faith is concerned. Janet, I know where you are where faith is concerned. If I could hear the people at, at Wilder, I would know where they are where faith is concerned. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes. You know, we don't need to really try to put on airs or convince somebody that we're somewhere where we aren't. 
you know, as we're faithful to put the word in, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about this in a minute, it, faith has a voice. Yes. It, it will speak. You don't have to force it to speak. It'll talk, and, I, and I'll, I'll show you about some of those things in a minute. Um, so this is really kind mm -hmm. of an Old Testament shadow of what faith is. Let's look at Romans 10, part C there. But the righteousness of faith speaks. Yeah. Might be a good thing to underline. Faith mm -hmm. speaks. Faith has a voice. Now, faith isn't going to have a voice if we're not putting it in. Okay? Faith speaks, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Well, that's what we were just reading in Deuteronomy 30. Paul's quoting that in Romans. The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Notice it says, it's in your mouth, in your heart. In your heart, in your mouth. <coughs> you don't put it in, it's not going to come out. You know, you can you can go along and you can say some right things every now and then. Yeah. But when the squeeze comes, what happens? Mm -hmm. You know, what's... Uh, what, what, the truth comes out. The truth comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, that we used to use an old analogy years and years ago when we were teaching faith. You know, we talked about squeezing an orange. Mm -hmm. What comes out? Orange juice. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what's in it when, when the squeeze mm -hmm. comes. And the same thing in life. Number six there. Let me just cut to the chase. Faith for every area of life works the same way as faith for salvation. How did you get saved? Somebody told you about the Lord. Somebody told you He was the Son of God. Somebody told you He died on a cross for you. The Word was shared with you. And what did you do? You believed it. And because you believed it, out of your mouth you said, I want to be saved. Out of your mouth you said, I believe that Jesus is the Lord. You called on the Lord. The Bible says, whoever calls on the Lord will be saved. So the word was put in on you, put in you, landed in your heart, and it spoke, and your heart spoke, and you said, Lord, save me. You call on the Lord. So faith for every area of life works the same way as faith for salvation, by saying with the mouth and believing in the heart. Faith speaks. Let me give you an example. I was in a rough place. Um, people at Wilder know this because I've, I've told them. Um, I was in a rough place a few years ago. Uh, my son was, was very near death. And uh, before that, the Lord had begun to work on us about what we put in on us and what we put on the inside, what we meditated. And one of the things he had started with was, um, he said, memorize Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is something you learn when you're a little kid. You know, there was my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Everybody's heard that. Yeah. And so the Lord says, you know, Frank, if you want to change the direction of your life, you need to start putting the word on the inside of you. Yeah. And so, and so... I began just saying every day, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And I had the whole thing memorized and would just say it over and over. You know, for quite a while, nothing changed. I was just putting it in. The good ground of my heart, the Word of God, God's Word, saying it, uh, Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. And so I was meditating, meditating, meditating. And, and quite... Oddly, one day I'm standing in front of the mirror, shaving, and I had been saying Psalm 23 for weeks, months, and I heard myself talk, and I and out of the inside of me said, "The days of lack are over." Where did that come from? Well, the Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want; I shall have no lack. I had been putting that in, and putting it in, and putting it in putting it in and planting it and planting it and planting it, meditating it, muttering it to myself, saying it over again, over and over again. And it had been a seed sown in my heart that had produced faith words. Faith speaks. You might say, well, Brother Frank, I don't know if I'm there yet. What are you saying? You know, what's coming out of you constantly? You can evaluate your own self, whether or not you're in faith. What are you saying? You know, if you're struggling with illness and all we're hearing is the doctor's report, you know, I got nothing against doctors, mm -hmm. but the doctor's voice is louder than the voice of God. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you, I have learned some things. I realize doctors, most of them, are not enemies of God. Doctors are trying to accomplish the same things that God is. 
But if I'm talking to you, if you're in the hospital and I'm visiting you and, and I come in and the first thing I hear is, well, the doctor said this, the doctor said this, after this because the doctor said I have to do this because the doctor said, you know, so-and-so is saying this, you know, I'm going to get a test on Monday, you know. And I begin to hear what the doctor's saying. Seems to me that what's, what's in your heart is the word of the doctor. But if I come into your hospital room and, you, and the first thing I hear is, you know, is Pastor Frank, by the stripes of Jesus, boy, I'm healed. Oh, mm-hmm. I begin to hear faith. Faith has a voice. Let's go on. Romans 10, we're going to be in this all month. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Uh, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, mm-hmm. one believes unto righteousness. What happened in the heart? The word was sown in the heart. The word of God changes us. Isaiah 55 says that the word of God does not return void. When we plant it in our heart, it accomplishes what it's sent to do. And so it's because of God's word that we can be righteous. It's because of the blood that Jesus shed that we can be cleansed from our sin. So it says, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the, conf- and with the mouth... Confession is made unto salvation. Well, what's the mouth speaking? Faith. You know, faith is a byproduct of the word that's sown in our hearts. So, step one, five infallible steps of faith. Step one is meditation. We take the word. You can't have faith where you don't know the word. We talked about last week, faith begins where the word of God is known. Okay, so what area do you need God to move in? Pick one. You know, maybe there's several. Mm -hmm. My question to you would be then, what does the Word of God say about that area Mm -hmm. in your life? What does it say? I'll just tell you, you know, if you play this one, I'd probably have to deny it, but I've been having a terrible time at work. Um, Mm -hmm. (coughs) I'm certain that my boss is the reincarnation of Satan himself, you know? I mean, it just, it just, sometimes I think that about her. Um... (laughs) It's probably not a good thing because it's going to be online. Um, But so I got this situation at work, and so I want God to move in it. And so God's first comment to me is, well, what's my word say about that situation? Because we need to get faith working there. And so one of the things that the Bible says, word that I can go to to speak and put on the inside of me, is the Bible says I'm supposed to pray for those that have authority over me, that I may live a peaceable life, inside and on the outside. Oh, my husband should pray that. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and, so, <laughs> and so here I have this situation that I need faith to work. Mm-hmm. And, so, and so what I've got to do is, is not whine about it, not gossip about it. Mm-hmm. Honestly, not complain to God about it. Now, you can take your complaint to God anytime. Mm-hmm. He's happy to hear it. But he's going to say, what does my word say? Let's begin to dwell on my word. Let's begin to meditate my word. Let's begin to speak my word. Let's, let's get it flowing out of you. Let's get it flowing into you. Let's get it sown in your heart so that it can produce a word fruit so that faith can begin to have a voice. And faith's a powerful, a powerful source. You know, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. What was God doing? He was speaking what he believed. What happened? Light happened. He had faith-filled mm-hmm. words. He spoke faith-filled words. He's our example. We need to speak faith-filled words. So that's mm-hmm. the, you know. So there I was in this situation, and God's answer to my to my desperate plea was, "What's my word say? Let's do this Joshua one eight thing. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Let's start putting my word in your mouth, Frank, and let's see where that thing goes. And I will tell you, things are beginning to turn around because faith, God's word. The faith that it produces is beginning to move in that situation. It's that way in any situation. So step two, B. I said, these step one, step two, these are not really, uh, um, you know, you can't go chapter and verse on these words, Mm -hmm. but the concepts are there. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is we're taking, this is actually Dr. Wingate put this thing together. This is kind of a unique approach to faith. It's It's a good outline, and so we're following that. Um, and so, you know, don't feel like, like I say, you can go to, you know, John 14 and it's going to talk to you about meditation, illumination, prayer of faith. You know, that stuff's in there. The phraseology is not in there, is what I'm saying. So yeah. he calls step two illumination. And his definition is illumination is where faith comes alive in the heart. And that's a, I understand that. That's a, that's a good way to look at this. You're, you're, you're speaking, you're, you're, 
reading the Word, you're speaking the Word, you're doing the meditation, and you're like, God, nothing's happened yet. Give it a chance. Continue to do that. Continue to do that. Continue to stand in it. Uh, and there will come a time when one of the best ways I can tell you, it'll just click. And really what's going on, you are a spirit being. You have a soul. You live in a body. Okay? And a lot of times meditation begins here. Okay? And it's rolling around in here, and it's, it's doing stuff. You may not realize it's doing stuff. It's doing stuff. Okay? But what it's going to end up doing, and we used to describe this, it's going to drop 18 inches to your heart. And it's going to get planted in here. The heart is the good ground. Mm -hmm. It's where the Word will reside and where it will grow. And so illumination is where the lights come on. We're going to talk about that. Is where faith comes alive in the heart. Illumination from God's Word produces renewing of the mind. But I will tell you, it is a two-way street. Okay? The other thing you want to do is get these two things connected. And, and this is, interestingly enough, between them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, I talked to you last week, and I told you that, you know, we're going to do some word studies. And so, this is kind of old-fashioned. Yeah. I realize, you know, it's not digital. Yeah. I realize it's not it's not a phone or a, or a, or an iPad, you know, and there's no apps associated with this. <laughs> My technician over there, Cody. That's okay, I have one. Okay, so but this is this is a wonderful book, and the way this works, you're going to have an example in Part B there, um, and I will just show you those that that prefer. <laughs> isn't that a wonderful smell? Yeah. You know, <laughs> look. Uh, those of you that prefer to use these things, you really do have a listing. And up here, for example, at the top, that wasn't a good place to turn to because that's just a really long word. I'll get that in a minute. But up here at the top, I have the word mightiest. Mm -hmm. And all down this column is every place that mightiest exists in the Bible. And so it shows it in a short phrase and then gives you a scripture listing and then gives you a number. And that number is keyed to two dictionaries in the back either a Hebrew dictionary or, if I get it to turn there, a Greek dictionary. Mm -hmm. If it's a regular number, that's the <coughs> Hebrew dictionary. If it's italicized, that's the Greek dictionary. So if you know the word, it's really, really easy to look up and find out, well, what is that word in the Hebrew? Or well, what is that word in the Greek? And what you'll find, the Strong's is key to the idea that the Old Testament is Hebrew, the New Testament is Greek. Yeah. Okay, so depending upon where you are, yeah. then you understand that italicized number is the Greek dictionary. Uh, straight up and down number is the uh, is the um, Hebrew dictionary. And so what we have here in step B of your notes is we have from uh, the Greek potizo. Okay, and you'll notice there's a number there. That mm -hmm. is the Strong's number. If you wanted to look it up in the Greek dictionary, you would look under 5461. Mm -hmm. And you would find meanings like this under it. To yeah. shine a light on. Literally, to shed rays of light. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking mm -hmm. about the Word of God. Mm -hmm. We're talking about faith. You know, good scripture to write in. There. <coughs> um, is this going to be on the test, Pastor Frank? Probably not. But it's a good one to know. Mm -hmm. Psalm 119. Let me get there. Psalm 119, verse 130. This really cuts through uh, all the clutter. Psalm 119, 130 says, The entrance of thy words yes, giveth light. light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. So what have we been talking about? This book of Joshua 1, 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, mm. but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. This book of the law, what's it going to do? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so literally, the photizo, that Greek word means to shed light, and that's what God's word does. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. That's good news for us. Yes. If we are his children, and we look in his word, mm. no matter what it looks like, you need to understand, by faith, you do not walk around in the dark. Amen. Even if you're not sure where you're yes. going, uh, there's an old song that I love that I love to sing. Ann actually used to sing. We did it uh, many years ago. Uh, did, a, did a lot. Uh, I know who holds tomorrow. Yes. I may not know who holds tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so I'm walking along with God. I'm going to be walking through a place as dark as Mammoth Cave. Mm-hmm. But I've got him by the hand. Okay, because mm-hmm. I've got his word. And it, and I have the light. I've got a hold of the light. I may not understand where I'm going, but when the light points one direction, that's the direction I go. So this, this illumination in the heart, mm-hmm. all of a sudden the lights turn on. means literally to shed rays of light or to give understanding to. Now what what, uh, the notes do here is they compare revelation and illumination. I will tell you that's a wonderful exercise. We're going to do a little bit of it. I honestly don't know, except that some of this stuff is going to be on the test, I honestly don't know that it's uh, it's an exercise we need to pursue too much. Because of the way language works, when I say revelation, you think about a lot of things. I think about the book of Revelation. I think about the fact that this entire book is a revelation of God's Word. I also think revelation means all of a sudden, sudden something has come alive in my heart. Now I have the revelation of it. What Dr. Wingate likes to do is that coming alive in your heart, mm-hmm. he likes to reserve the word illumination for that. So it's all about- if that works for you, great. And there are some mm-hmm. things that we even talk about in this faith course that, that other teachers use that quite honestly I've stumbled over for years. And I thought, you know what, I just can't go there. I understand that that language works, but I've got to use a language that I understand. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, you know, what Bible have you got? Have you got the NIV? Have you got the King James? Have you got the Amplified? Have you got the Message? Let's get a language that works. So I'm just saying that to understand. Revelation versus illumination, that's just a language thing. But if it helps you to think book of Revelation or that this whole thing is a revelation, but when it comes alive in your heart, that's illumination, If that works for you, great, use that. That's really what I want to tell you. And so in part two under B, Revelation versus Illumination, he says Revelation is God's Word. The first time it has been revealed. So it was revealed when it was written down. Okay, there we go. There's the revelation of God's Word. Part B, Illumination is God's Word the first time it has been revealed to you. Mm. And so that helps you understand that there is a level where the lights can come on in your heart. The lights can come on in your mind. That really is an interesting viewpoint of that. Um, but it, it's it's a play on words. But here again, that help, if that helps you, that's a good thing. Latch on to that. Use that. Um, so again, part A, revelation is God's word the first time it has been revealed. This is the revelation of God. Um, and sometimes we even talk about it as a progressive revelation. Genesis through maps. Yeah. I mean, all the way to the end. Um, Illumination is God's word. The first time it has been re- revealed to you, though it has been written for ages. You know, here it is. Um, um, part C, revelation may still come to the believer today if God needs to inform that believer of something that cannot be conveyed through the illumination of the scriptures, such as God guiding you in life or ministry. Have you been in those situations? Illumination is the spiritual hearing from God's word that produces faith. I like that. Yeah. Because we're talking about this revealed word of God there it is out there. It's not in me yet until I put it in me. Then when it's put in me, spiritually I'm understanding it. Spiritually, spiritually it's being turned on on the inside of me. Spiritually it is producing the fruit of faith. It's producing faith words that are speaking you know, out of me. What is that? I have the illumination now. I have the full understanding of it. Now I always used to say, well, it's revealed to me. <coughs> And I knew what that meant. So either works, you know, whatever is good for you. Now, we're constantly tying this into um, salvation. Under under letter D there, uh, illumination is the spiritual hearing from God's Word that produces faith, number one. With the heart, man believes. Romans 10.10, 10, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. When you hear the Word of God, you believe. But you know what? The Bible says that the devils also believe and tremble. Why? Because they've not done anything about it. They've not said anything. Part E, the Word of God when believed by a person produces a washing or cleansing of the heart. Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word. Uh, You might also look at John 15.3 in that regard right there. Let me turn there. Jesus is talking about what abiding in the vine, yes. abiding in the Word does. John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine, 
and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now think about this illustration. We read this lot and then just gloss over it. There's this vine coming up out of the ground. And there are branches attached to it. We are the branches. Yeah. Okay? If we're not bearing fruit, what are they going to do? They're going to cut it off. Because the goal of the branch is to bear fruit. Yeah. All right? So that's what we're talking oh, about. Verse 2, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it or prunes it. Um, um, you know, when, when I like to grow tomatoes, when they come up, one of the things that I have, you have the main vine, and then you'll have a branch that goes off like this. A lot of times in that fork, they'll do what we call a sucker. Just, mm -hmm. just sucking up nutrition but not producing anything. I break them off so that the branch gets all the nutrition and mm. produces the fruit. Um, verse 3 says, I'm sorry, verse 2, He purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Uh, verse 3, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Okay, Abide in me and I in you. And he's talking about his word. Yeah. He's putting his word in that puts us, at, that, that hooks us into the vine. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. So what are we doing? We're taking this word, and we're and we're reading it, and we're praying it, and we're muttering it, and we're hearing it over and over and over. We're meditating, 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 meditating. We're putting it in. We're putting it in. What I'm having it. That's okay. Don't worry. Keep putting it in. Keep putting it in. And all of a sudden it drops, and we have the illumination. Okay, mm -hmm. and then it begins to produce, and all of a sudden there is that fruit out there on that word plant. What's happened? Faith begins to speak. Well, I'm not there yet. You'll know when you're there. The words will begin to come out of you. You'll not. There'll be a. Uh, the Old Testament prophet says a fire will, you know, shut up in my bones. Yeah. You know, it'll it'll just it'll explode out of you. You won't be able to keep silent. Mm -hmm. Let yourself get to that point. Take the Word of God and let it have that work on the inside of you. Yes. Okay, so yes. step step or part step three, part C, the prayer of faith. How we do a long time? Just a few minutes. We'll, we'll run through this and and then uh, uh, we'll take a break. Step three, the prayer of faith. Um, the prayer of faith, point one under there, releases your power to receive a covenant promise of God by faith. Now that faith. That prayer of faith would be motivated by the Word. Can we have faith where we don't know the Word? No. Faith begins where the Word of God is known. Mm -hmm. So can we have a prayer of faith if we don't know the Word? No. We can have a prayer of desperation. We might think we need, we might be, you know, yelling and screaming and crying and snotting all over the carpet, you know, but there's no faith in that. A lot of emotion in that, and we might even feel good after we do that, but what does God honor? God honors His Word. God responds to faith. And so the prayer of faith is going to be something that's motivated by the Word. Can you pray the prayer of faith if you don't know the Word? No. Because faith comes where the Word is known. So the prayer of faith releases your power, that power of the Word on the inside of you, to receive a covenant promise. These are the covenant promises. What are they? This is the Word. See, it's just a real simple process. The Word, faith, it speaks, we receive. The Word becomes faith, it speaks, we receive. This is just one avenue of it, the prayer of faith. So read that again. The prayer of faith releases your power to receive a covenant promise of God by faith, which is motivated by the Word. You take spiritual possession of a promise before you take actual possession in the natural. That's true. You're going to speak it before you see it. Now it might be a split second before you see it, mm -hmm. but you know, you're going to take possession of it in the Spirit. You're going to have it. You're going to know you have it. When I say in the Spirit, by faith. Your faith is going to speak. Your faith is going to stand. You're going to have it. Then it's going to manifest. And we'll go on more with this as we get into confession and that kind of thing. Um, there's actually, you know, we look at it, there's a sense of the prophetic here. Mm hmm. You know, the prophet would say, this is going to happen. Has it happened yet? No. Well, that prophet's a liar. No, no, no. You know, those faith words are out there. It's going to take place. Mm -hmm. uh, the prophet said there's going to be a Messiah born. Well, I'll see him. Where is he? Mm -hmm. You know, well, it's already happened. Mm -hmm. 
in the spirit. It's been yes. spoken. All we're waiting for, and, and we would do this, and sometimes we get caught up and don't have exact understanding. We'll hope to have time to go into it. But we would we would speak these words, and we think, well, you know, uh, 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 I'm waiting for the manifestation. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but make sure that the waiting for the manifestation mm -hmm. has been generated by faith yeah. words. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's actually there's a bit of prophetic in this. Mark 11, 23, 24. For assuredly I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says. Now what's the says? Whoever says and does not doubt in his heart, but believes. Why does he believe? Because the word of God has been put, in, put inside. You just can't decide. A lot of people make this mistake. You just can't decide one day, I'll be in faith. That's all your strength and none of the supernatural that's motivated by the Word. So we're beginning to get this, right? We're going to yes. see that you know it's not something we decide to do. It's yes. something, putting the Word in is what we decide to do. Mm -hmm. And then the faith will grow. The more we're faithful to, the, to, the, to getting the Word in, the more likely it is to happen more and more quickly. For as sure that I say, and you're back to this scripture, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask mm. when you pray, believe. There it all is. Uh, that you receive them and you will have them. A good scripture to write here is 1 John 5. This also says it very well. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. John is saying, uh, and this <coughs> is the confidence yes. that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will well how do we know his will here's his will we've gotten in the book yeah. okay and so first off I fourteen. this is the confidence that we have in him the faith that we have that if we ask anything according to his will well if we ask it according to his will that means we've been in his will that means we've taken his word we've muttered it we've meditated it we put it on the inside you know we thought about it thought about it day and night you know this book of the law of Joshua 1 8 shall not depart out of your mouth but you shall meditate therein day and night see it's all working the same way this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask we know that we have the yes. petitions that we've desired of him yes. if God said he's going to do a thing Isaiah 55 says my word does not return void if you stood on my word, it will accomplish the thing that I sent it to accomplish. And so what are we doing? We're just waiting. Yes. You know, it is going to happen. I don't have to worry about when it's going to happen. I have God's word on it. I'm meditating God's word on it. It's going down on the inside of me, producing faith. And faith is a force. Yes. Faith is a destructive force in the devil's kingdom. Amen. Faith is a currency in the kingdom of God. Faith is the thing that God hears. Faith is the thing that moves yeah. God. Moves God. Faith, faith is the thing that causes us to be able to stand in patience and peace. Okay, because we have His Word. And that's what it says. This is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His Word, we know we have it. You know? okay, mm -hmm. So that's how, that's how faith works. That's what faith is. Yeah. <coughs> you know, um, well, I'm Presbyterian. Well, that's my faith. No, that's not. That's a. That's that's not faith. And we've thought those things. Mm -hmm. well, my faith is baptism. No, that's not faith. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, or we are of the faith. Well, really, what are you talking about? You know, mm -hmm. where we belong to Christianity. Well, that's not faith. Mm -hmm. This is what faith is. Um, tell us do. We are right at about forty-five minutes. Um, any questions? Everybody okay? On this page, got the book. Uh, wilder people, this is what you need to have. If you don't have one, contact Andrea here at church. Um, let's go ahead and take about uh, 10 minutes, and we will come back with step four, um, uh, part D. Okay? After you've believed it, and before the answer has come, or the promise has been manifested, there's that phrase I'd used before. You know, we're standing, we're standing, we got faith going in, we got faith, we got a word going in, we got a word going in. It's producing faith, faith is speaking, but we're not quite having, you know, holding the thing yet. Um, and so, uh, let me read that again. Confession is speaking the word after you have believed it and before the answer has come or the promise has been manifested. 
It is also referred to sometimes as the confession of faith, because what does that tell you? Faith speaks, you know, and so, and so um, the word has been in, you put it in, you put it in, and now you're beginning to say the right things, okay? Yes. Um, what if you don't get an instant manifestation? Well, then you stand in confession. And so let's read some of these points. Number one, confession is where the battle is won or lost. And that's true. I've, I've you know, one of the places we see this, I've, I've uh, been, been ministering somewhere perhaps and will have, Lord lead me to have a, a, a prayer line for healing or something. Mm -hmm. Ask people to come up to be healed. Mm -hmm. And I'll lay hands on them and I'll, and I'll, I'll speak yeah. the word over them. Uh, and they look at their body and they don't have it yet. And they say, mm. oh, I didn't get it. What spoke? Faith. Mm -hmm. Faith in the wrong thing. Yes. You know, sometimes we call that negative faith. But actually, what was in their heart spoke. They looked at a circumstance. Mm. They let that drop into their heart and become a reality. And they confessed it. Mm. And, and unfortunately, in that instance we get what we confess. So point one, confession is where the battle is won or lost. Many Christians undo their prayer of faith by negative thinking and confession. Mm. Faith is going to work. What's in your heart is going to speak, and it is going to produce. You ever hear somebody say, well, if it's going around, I'll get it? Mm. Now what happens? Mm -hmm. It goes around and they get it. Yeah. What are they doing? They're operating in faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're just believing the wrong thing. Okay, um, mm. let's read the next one. Glory. When the enemy, Satan and his demons, come to you to taunt you after you have prayed the prayer of faith. Everybody ever do that? Mm -hmm. Stand in faith and all of a sudden you realize, oh, how stupid am I? Mm -hmm. You know, and this is not working and I really ought to do something else. Uh, who's, who's putting those thoughts in your mind? Well, we know. Glory. Number two, when the enemy, Satan and his demons, come to you to taunt, to taunt you after you have prayed the prayer of faith, you must continue to resist him with the same word through which you received faith. Mm. And so the example I gave you, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. One translation says, I shall have no lack. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the checkbook and it says zero. Well, what did I say to get there at the beginning? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall have no lack. The checkbook is screaming zero, 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 zero. What do I say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall mm -hmm. have no lack. That becomes a confession then. Okay, and I'm in that place before I've received it. Uh, so uh, you must continue to resist him with the same word through which you received faith. You must hold fast to your confession of faith in order to receive a promise. There was a, um, there is a pastor, Charles Capps was his name. Mm -hmm. This is not new doctrine. Uh, this has been, that we, we've known this for a while, which is a good thing. Uh, and there's been different, uh, uh, not applications, but different um, ways of relating it over the decades. This, like I say, this is not a new doctrine. And a guy named Charles Capps talked about calling the dog. Mm -hmm. And he would say, when the dog is not there, what do you do? You call the dog. Why are you calling the dog? Because the dog is not there. Mm. Are we are we in denial? And people will say, you know, well, you're not. You know, what are you doing saying, you know, by his stripes I'm healed? You're sick. Well, I know what the circumstances are, oh, yeah. but I also know what faith says. And so, the healing is not there yet. So, what are we doing? We're calling the healing. We're not. We're not saying I'm not sick. Mm -hmm. We're saying the Bible says I'm healed. Not, we're, not, we're not in denial. And so if I'm sitting on the back porch and the dog is not there, mm -hmm. it's only logical to call the dog. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, people might say, well, Frank, why are you calling the dog? There's no dog. Can't you, you idiot? Can't you see there's no dog? Of course I see there's no dog. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm calling it. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's why I'm making the confession because there is no dog. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm sick, that's why, that's why I'm saying by his stripes I'm healed. That's why I'm saying he sent his word and healed me. Um, because I recognize that the thing is not there. And so I'm calling it. I'm making the confession. That's really, to me that just made all kinds of sense. Mm -hmm. Now, point A under two says, let us hold fast our confession. 
we can vacillate back and forth in our emotions. This is not an emotional thing. You know, I mean, your emotions can be screaming. You know, go to the doctor, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. Well, you know, now I'm going to tell you something. And this is probably a good point, good place to make this point. Not going to the doctor or refusing to go to the doctor does not mean you're in faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. People think, well, I just won't go to the doctor. No, oh, that makes me in faith. No, no, no. That can actually put you in crisis. Yeah. That can turn a bad situation deadly. Yeah. If faith is speaking and saying, I am healed, and as a result, you don't go to the doctor, that's entirely different than saying, deciding mm -hmm. with your mind, I won't go to the doctor, and mm -hmm. assuming that's faith. There's a great preacher, Fred Price, has a, yeah. has a book uh, and a phraseology, Faith, Foolishness, or Presumption. Mm -hmm. You know, foolishness is choosing a course of action that you don't have the faith to stand in. How do we get faith? I know what the Word says. I have put it on the inside of me, and it's beginning to speak. I can stand in that. Okay? I'm trying to order circumstances to make it look like you're in faith. That's dead. And that's what I'm saying. It says here, point A, let us hold fast our confession. Why? Because our emotions can tell us, you know, this isn't working. Well, I'm not doing this based on my emotions. Back to the Charles Capps analogy, I'm calling the dog. I know the dog is not there. And I might even get frustrated with the dog because he's not there. I might even get emotional and call a little louder because he's not there. Why am I doing that? Because I know he's not there. Okay? So I don't let the emotions, uh, whether it looks good, looks bad, determine how I am going to uh, confess. Let's look at the scripture there, Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus knows where we are. Jesus knows, there's a, there's a scripture in Corinthians that says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He knows that we have this wonderful spiritual thing in a faulty vessel. Okay. So it's saying there, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Of course, we've already talked about, I think we talked last week, what that grace really is. Grace is divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. Grace is God's ability. Grace is not unmerited favor. That's a real bad definition. Grace is God's power working in our life. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Part B, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. Let's read this. Uh, Therefore, brethren, Hebrews 10, 19, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, because it's the blood of Jesus that makes us righteous. Righteous is our ability to stand before God as if there's never been sin. Yes. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. How can we have a true heart in full assurance of faith? We know what the Word says about who we are and the righteousness that is by the blood of Jesus so that we can stand in the presence of God and ask these things. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled. Sprinkled refers to the blood of Jesus Christ. Sprinkling yes. is, is a blood sacrifice. Sprinkling from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Mm -hmm. The Bible compares mm -hmm. the Word of God to pure water. So it's the Word of God. What's it doing? It's going on the inside of us. It's building faith. It's Amen. washing our minds. Amen. It's washing our being, cleaning us out. Let us hold Amen. fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Remember when confession happens? Confession happens after you've heard the Word and you've made the prayer of faith, but you don't have the thing yet. You don't possess it in the natural. What do you do then? You confess. Uh, part C, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What do you confess? The same thing that made faith happen. The same word. Continue to confess that. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down the right hand of the throne of God. He operated in faith. 
He saw that thing that was said before him. He knew what the Word said about him. He confessed what the Word said about him. He walked it out. And what did walking out do? It put him on the cross and it sent him to hell. It didn't look like he had won. To his disciples, it darn sure didn't look like he had won. Their Savior was dead and laying in a grave. They held their confession. Jesus tells us to hold his confession, hold our confession. He held his confession. He knew what the word said about him and he had victory over the grave. Amen. And he rose from the dead. Yes. Glory. In that time, he was standing. He had a confession. What was the confession? What it always was with him, the word of God. Okay. Step five. We go right into possession. Possession, point one, is when the promise has manifested. You can see it and touch it. Let's get back to the calling the dog example. I'm sitting there on the back porch. The dog is not there. I know the dog is not there. I don't say the dog is not here because I want the dog here. So I say, yeah. That's, a, that's Kentucky, how you say it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> dog. Yeah. yeah. My, my Brittany Spaniel, his name was Zeke. And I let him out of the pen and he'd run off. He wasn't there with me. I said, Yazzie, Yazzie. Mm -hmm. You know, and he would come. Now, he's a dog, but he's smart enough to know that if he comes and he and he'd come up on the I'd be sitting on the edge of the edge of the porch and he'd come up in behind me and he'd stick his head under my arm because mm -hmm. he wanted me to pet him. And if I didn't pet him with that hand, he'd run around behind me and stick his head on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now he's a dog. But he but if the dog comes and he's there and I continue to say, Yazzie, Yazzie. Even he knows that's stupid. He's like, I'm here. What are you doing? What else you want me to do? And so when we possess the thing, we no longer need to call it. What do we do then? We thank God for it. Yes. You know, it stays, it kind of stays in that, let me put it this way, not in that confession mode, in that vocal mode. You know, we quoted the word. It got down on the inside of us. We begin to speak it. Faith has a voice. You do speak faith. We're in this interim time where we don't quite have it yet. And so what do we do? The same thing, put faith on the inside of us. We continue to speak out. That becomes our confession. It's not a denial. We know that we don't have the thing yet. We're not stupid. But what we're saying is the Word of God because faith has a voice and faith speaks. And what we want faith saying is God's Word. So then we finally have it. Then that, that, that just changes to thanks because we're in a place of possession then. It's all faith. My thanks is based in is my thanks, I will tell you, is my faith still speaking. Mm. It's gone over into thanks is what it's done. This is, point two, this is different from the spiritual possession that you took when you prayed the prayer of faith. Isaiah 55, 11. Let's look at this. If you have not read this scripture, this really is a scripture that we need. Amen. We need to be aware of. Amen. Uh, it's something that, it's, it defines the process. And we can stand in the defining of the process. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Let's stop there a second. Where did the word of God originate? It originated in God. And God's saying, it's going to come forth out of my mouth. Well, evidently, he's allowing for a... For a um, a, a time lapse in there. Look at what this says. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Yeah. So he realizes, even God realizes, he's sending his word out. Now he's God. There can be a real quick bounce back. But he realizes there's a sending it out and a coming back to him. He sends it out. It, it brings back what he sent it after. And he says it doesn't ever return void. It doesn't ever return empty. It doesn't return without the thing that I sent it to. Mm -hmm. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper yes. in the thing whereto I sent it. When we speak faith words, words that are built on what we know of the word of God, we plant on the inside of us, it goes out there and accomplishes a thing. Well, I don't see the manifestation yet. Well, that's confession. And I confess until I had the until I had the possession. When it arrives, it no longer takes. This says 
point three no longer takes faith. I'm going to say it no longer takes the same kind of faith because we still know the word, and whenever we're standing in the word, we're standing in faith. Faith will produce thanksgiving. Faith will produce yeah. praise. Okay, so we have the lack, we have the want, we find out what the word says about our situation, we sow it in our lives. That's meditation. Then faith begins to grow. Faith begins to have a voice. Faith turns into a prayer. Faith turns into a confession. Faith is the word going out. It's God's word. It's bringing the thing back to us. It's accomplishing where it's sent. We have possession. It turns into thanks. It turns into praise. Now, there are people that will tell you, and this is a good thing also, that you can praise God before you have the thing. Why would you do that? Well, we're, we're trying to get God over on our side. No, God's already on your side. You know, we're praising because we have the illumination on the inside that we've already got it. Well, I've already got this. Thank you, Lord. We mean you've already got it. I understand what God's Word will do. You know, I don't need to see it. I know I have it. It's there. Um, faith, I will tell you, goes against the stream of popular opinion. Uh, faith walks against the current. Faith possesses the thing before you have the thing. Okay? That's what we're talking about uh, all this month. Let's go to point six. This is good stuff. We can spend a lot of time there. Um, but point six, we're gonna. This is a this is a huge part of what we're gonna do uh, tonight. All these oh, principles yes. that we've talked about, we get to study in the life of Abraham. Abraham is a wonderful study. Um, one of the things I don't know. This is just this may be kind of a side note. Maybe you do this. Maybe you don't. I want to encourage you to do this. Um, the Bible says that we have the lives of people recorded in the Bible as an example to us. Um, I. There have been times that I have very much identified with Joseph, that he was that he was sold into slavery, uh, that that God had His hand on his life and the direction of it um, when it really didn't look like that God's life was on, on God's hand was on Joseph's life. You know, Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. Uh, he ended up a slave in Potiphar's house. He ended up thrown in the dungeon from there. You know, it really didn't like good God's hand was on his life, but it was on his life. And so I, I identify with him. There have been times that I've identified with the life of Paul. Why is Paul's yeah. life recorded in here? So it can be an example yes. to us. Okay? Yes. And so Abraham is another one that you can study his life and you can see, well, you know, what did God do with him? Well, God will do those things with me. Romans 4, 16. Abraham, part 6 here. Abraham is our example of faith at work. Um, I will tell you all good stuff. Um, as I read through this, there may be some things that you agree with, don't agree with. Let God speak them to your heart. I will tell you that there's so many points here. I'm not sure I agree with all of them, but it's a great study in faith. I'm just telling you that. Um, Romans 4.16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. And remember, grace is essentially, no time to define it all tonight, is essentially God's ability. Yes. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This, this first half of the book, this is the law. You know, this is before the grace of Jesus Christ. This is before his sacrifice. Um, but Abraham is before the law. So Abraham operated in faith. Uh, the yeah. law came to show us that we needed a Savior. Yeah. The law came to show us that we had sin in our lives. The law was never designed to save us. Amen. Jesus Amen. is designed to save us. Yeah. The law was to show us that we need a Savior. My point is, before the law, we had Abraham. That's good. And Abraham operated in faith. So point, point A there. Mm. His life shows how faith grows as we continually hear God's Word. And what are we talking about? Put the word in, put the word in, put the word in, put the word in. Faith grows, it grows, it grows, it grows. It speaks, it speaks more. More word you know, more areas you have faith. You know, maybe you have faith in the area of healing. Maybe you never get sick because you're, here, you're constantly hearing the word of faith in that area. And so it's producing, you know, health in your body. But maybe you're dirt poor because you don't know what the word says about finance. Um, or maybe you can't get along with people because you don't know what the word says about relationships, you know. And so these are these are all don't don't volunteer information. These are all uh, areas of our lives where we can hear what the word says. When we hear what the word says, and we have faith to operate in that, you know. I used to put myself under all kinds of common con condemnation because I didn't witness very much. 
How could I witness very much if I did not know what the Word said about witnessing? How could I be in a place of faith if I didn't know what the Word said? If you want to become an evangelist, find out what the Word says about it. Let it build faith on the inside of you. And then you'll just, you will just you will walk in it. You won't be able to not walk in it. So this is what we're going to see with Abraham's life, this kind of thing. Point A, his life shows how faith grows as we continue to hear God's Word. And then here's a scripture we've been using uh, both weeks. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Yes, we've been doing that. I'm not going to spend time there. Point B, God worked with Abram for many years, stating the covenant again and again. That's an interesting point. Um, I'm not at this point able to say exactly you know, how God worked with Abram. There's a point that I'm going to make at the end. But the point is, and we'll see this, that over and over and over and over, God is doing with Abraham what he wants Abraham to do, which is God is saying, I've got this covenant with you. Here's my covenant. God's saying, I'm stating my covenant. Okay. And so, uh, point one. And let's go to Genesis. I'm just going to let everybody get there because uh, we're going to, it's, it's the story of Abraham there. Um, Genesis 12 is where we're going to start. Several chapters uh, to live his life. <coughs> Um, Genesis 1 through 3 Genesis 12 1 through 3 let me read those verses first then we'll go back and check the notes now the Lord had said unto Abram get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing excuse me and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed what is that? that is the initial statement of the covenant or the deal, uh, and and this deal is going to be set in blood. That the deal wants that God wants to have with Abram, the relationship that He wants to have with Abram. Uh, it's, it's a two-way street. Okay. So anyway, your point one there under B. This was the first time Abram heard the promise of God's word. All right. Point two. Um, now he makes the point. Abram stepped out, but only in partial obedience. Because he did not leave his family, but took his father and nephew with him, even allowing his father to lead the expedition. I really don't know about this, even allowing his father to lead the expedition, but the point is, if you'll back up a couple verses in chapter 11, and Terah took Abram his son, Terah was, was Abram's father, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. Where had God said go? Go to the land of Canaan. How had he said to go there? Leave your father and his family. Had he left his father and his family? No. So he set out and he didn't leave his father and family. Now let me be honest with you. Sometimes there are people around you that do what they want to do. You know? And you can't do anything about that. I'm not ready to blame Abram. You know, Abram says I'm leaving. And dad says I'll go with you. <laughs> no, you can't go with me. I'm going with you. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. i got to obey God. I'm going. Lot says, I'm going with you. You're not supposed to go with me. I'm going with you anyway. We're really quick to blame Abram, and yeah. I don't know that it was Abram's fault. Okay? Matter of fact, and I, and I see this a lot in, in various things, all times where I work. If a good thing's happening, we have this expression, everybody wants to hitch their wagon to it. Mm. You know, Amen. what is Amen. that? That's people being people. <laughs> you know, and so and so although he didn't completely obey God, I'm not certain that Abraham could have done much about it. Quite honestly, uh, my father has, has passed away a few years ago, but but usually, and I'm and I'm 53 years old. I was 50, and my dad was 80, and quite honestly, if Dad said, "Here's what we're going to do," you know what? That's what we did, because he's dad. You know, um, and so. You know, that's a squishy place. I'm just not really uh, yeah. comfortable with, with blaming Abram a whole lot. And really, if I don't think I don't think God was so bent out of shape either. All right? Because at least Abram was moving. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not I'm not condoning partial obedience. If you know God has said do something, you need to do in your power what you can to do what he's told you to do. Let's go on. Uh, point three, they could not move on until Terah died, Genesis eleven thirty two. So, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. 
Um, and so if you notice right after that, then about where we started in Genesis 12, now the Lord had said to Abram, get thee out of thy country. Okay, so verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. So finally, after his father died, then he can go and he leaves things. But notice, and Lot went with him. Mm -hmm. So Lot's still yeah. hanging on. I'm not so certain that it's Abram. I think Abram knows what God has said. Yeah. But Lot, Lot's kind of tenacious. <laughs> and he realizes, hey, Abram's going to be blessed. I want to be there when that <laughs> happens. Well, Lot's not stupid. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, Genesis 12.4, we, we read that. Uh, point five. Uh, go over to 12.7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So, point five, God stated his covenant to Abram the second time. And each time, there's a little bit more. He said, I'll bless you, but now he says, unto thy seed will I give this land. Mm. So now he's extending the blessing on, he said all the families of the earth will be blessed, and if they bless you, I'll bless them. If they curse you, I'll curse them. We got this deal. You know, we're, we're, yeah. we're blood covenant together. But now he's saying, I'm specifically, I'm going to extend it to your children. Well, you really can't blame Lot. He realized, you know, he knew from the beginning that Abram was going to be blessed. He knew Abram had a covenant with God. And Lot just says, I want some of that, so I'm going with you. <laughs> and so it just says there, Lot also which went with Abram and had flocks and herds and tents. Now, let me, let me tell you, let that be encouraging to you. Mm. If there's somebody in the body of Christ that has something that you don't have and you, and you want to know mm. how they get, how they got what they got and where they are, whether it's healing, whether it's, whether it's, financial prosperity, Amen. Amen. whether it's peace with God, whatever it may be, get next to them. Yes. You know. Um, so, uh, that's all Lot's doing. And I'm a little hesitant to, you know, to be judgmental. I just realize, you know, that's a good idea, Lot. I think I'd have done the same thing. So, yes. verse 5, And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks, herds, and tents. Verse 6, And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so great, so that they could not dwell together. There's not yeah. enough pasture for all of our stuff, all of our cattle, all of our sheep, everything, all of our camels, everything that we got. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Mm. And also, at the, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in land also. So there's other people needing that grazing pasture. Mm -hmm. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and you, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we're brothers. Let's don't fight. Mm -hmm. And let's don't have the guys working for us fight either. Mm -hmm. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself, I pray you, from me. If thou wilt take the left, then I'll go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt, as I come unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Okay, important to notice that. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent, tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after the Lot was separated from him. When did the Lord speak to him again? After, after Lot was gone. What had God told him from the very beginning? Leave your father leave your family. God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Abram wasn't completely obedient. I really believe Abram did what he could do. Mm -hmm. And God blessed him anyway. Yeah. Then his father died, and he went on, and God blessed him some more. And then he fell into fear down in Egypt, and God blessed him some more. Then he had Lot mm -hmm. still hanging around with him, and they were so blessed that they couldn't live together because there just wasn't enough land to, to sustain all this stuff. And then finally, Lot and Abram separate. And God talks again to him. See, God's not giving up yes. on him. Amen. God's not giving us, giving up on us. We, we get what faith we can on the inside of us, and God blesses us on account of that. And then we step to the next level of faith, and God blesses us on account of that. And then we step to the next level of faith, and God blesses us on account of that. With God, everything is a positive. Everything mm -hmm. is an encouragement. Everything is a blessing. We're blessed. I'm blessed. You want to be blessed more? Get more word in you. Become more obedient. Yeah. That's something that is a progressive thing that takes time. 
It takes working it out. The Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Get more of it, get more of it, get more of it, get more of it. And God's not bent out of shape. Well, I missed that there, God. That's okay. I'm not worried about that. My blood covers that. The yeah. blood of my son covers that. What would you do right? Let's bless that. All right, let's go on to the next thing. Let's do, get something else right. Let's bless that. Let's get something else right. Let's bless that. Let's find out what the Word says. Let's put you in faith in that area, and let's bless that. And so you notice in all of this, God is not so concerned with what Abram's screwing up. He's blessing what he gets right. Every time Abram believes him. Can Abram walk it out perfectly? No. Can you and I? No. Does that change God's blessing? No. God still is blessing us. And so point A, Abram finally parted company with Lot because their herds were too large to share the same pasture. Verse 9, God spoke to Abram again. And so let's look at that in Genesis 13, verse, what is that, 14? And the Lord said unto Abram, after the Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And so now he's really being specific about a land. He said, go to the land that I'll show you. Now he's there and he says, look at this land. This is what I'm, this is what I'm going to give you. And not just to you, I'm going to give it to your seed. So each time he's getting more and more specific, stepping up the level, stepping up the level, stepping up the level. Uh, then he says, Arise, oh, I'll let me back up, back up here. And I will make thy seed, as the first 16, as the dust of the earth. Has he got any kids yet? No. What's God doing? Speaking faith. Yeah. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. So there's communication there. God is saying, I'm going to bless you, and Abram worships him. God says, I'm going to bless you, Abram worships mm -hmm. him. Okay. Um, cool. Cool. Okay, so the notes say point nine. Here God stayed this covenant the third time. Let's look at Genesis 14. There's some other things that go on there. There's a battle. Lot gets stolen. Uh, Abram, and you can read this at another time, Abram arms all his servants. He has 300 servants. <laughs> you know, that bear the sword, the Bible says. And, and so he goes after Lot and, and, and the enemy with his, with his own men of his own house and, and brings them back. Mm. Uh, so I'm in Genesis 14. This is after he's won the battle. Verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. Why would he say that? Because there was a covenant on him. He had a covenant with God. There was a blessing on him. He was believing God. He was walking in faith. And he gave him tithes of all. Abram did to Melchizedek. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of men which went with me. Uh, let them take their portion. So what he's saying is, you don't, you don't make me rich. rich. God yeah. has blessed me in this. I'm paying tithe of it, but it all came from God. I don't owe you anything. Mm -hmm. um, it, what he gave was a gift. Um, and so we come to verse or chapter 15. Um, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And so as a covenant man, the, one of the things to see here <clears throat> is that Abram begins to negotiate with God. What's the Bible say with us? Come boldly to the throne of grace mm -hmm. to find help in time of need. We have that. We have that right with God. Point 11, God spoke to... Um, 15, 1, 5, yeah. God spoke to Abram in a vision 
and stated the covenant a fourth time in response to Abram's doubt and complaint. And the complaint was, you told me you'd bless my seed, and I got no seed. Um, we go on. Um, verse 3, and, and Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven, and tell the stars if thou art able to number them. And he said to him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. What happened? He, he got the word of God. What do we have? The word of God. It was spoken to him. He put it in his heart. He decided to believe it. And look what happened. And verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Amen. Abraham increased in faith and believed God. This is a Bible. The Old Testament is full of what we call types and shadows. Types of Christ, shadows of the promises that, that, are, that are fulfilled in Christ. And this actually, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness, is a type or shadow from Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the mouth and for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made in salvation. That's Romans. That's New Testament. This Old Testament process. Remember I told you. Abram came before the law. Yes. Okay. And so Abram is a man that can walk and operate in faith. Um, uh, let's see. Verse 8. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit this land? Verse 9. And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. Now what's he really actually saying is he took those animals, and he split them right down the middle, and laid them open. There would have been a half an animal, and a half an animal, and blood in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what's laying on the ground. And when the fowls, verse 11, when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away, mm. the buzzards. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. It means it was a real deep sleep. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. He talks about the bondage in Egypt 400 years, and also that a nation whom they, they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards they'll go out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. He's telling them covenant things that are going to happen. But in the fourth generation it shall come hither again, and the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Now usually what would have happened, it is said covenant, is they'd have split those animals, blood would have been on the ground, and they'd have walked, the, the two that were established in covenant would have walked a figure eight through those animals, would have walked through the blood. And you know that you know the American, uh, the Native American, you know, were, were famous for, you know, cutting their wrists or their hands. Blood flowed. They mingled the blood. This is because Hebrews 9:22 says, "Without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Blood is the price for yes. forgiveness." And so, and so, God is taking this. We're talking about one statement of the covenant, higher statement of the covenant, higher and more detailed statement of the covenant. Now, what they're doing is their sealing in the blood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this is the blood of animals. We're going to see here in a little while that they're actually going to seal it in Abram's blood. He's going to get to spill some blood too. Okay. And and I'll tell you, the final thing is that God spills blood. God spills the blood of Jesus. Okay. So there is going to end up, as this covenant thing grows and grows and grows, level of faith, the level of faith, the level of faith, we first have the blood of animals. And then Abram spills his own blood through circumcision. And then eventually, God's going to spill his blood through his son. That's good. Okay. And so and that's where we stand today. We'll get there, but we're going to take a break now. And so, Wilder, give me about 10 minutes. I'm going to get something to, to drink around out of it. We're going to come back on point 14. And so you'll see the countdown here in just a second. Hagar, point, 14, point 15, began to despise her mistress, who was now... A, who was not able to provide a son for Abram as she had done. Um, and then verse 5, um, And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. She blamed Abram. Well, Abram, that was his fault. 
He was always the man's fault. It was in the fault. Thank you, Danielle. It's always the man's fault. Um, but Sarai blamed Abram. Um, and verse 6, But Abram said, Sarai, behold, thy maid is in thy hand. He, took, he put it back on her. He says, You're a maid. You know, you it's you have authority over here. You, her, you can do whatever you want to with her, and you gave her to me, and so I slept with her, and she has a baby now. You know, and so and so they're blaming each other. I can just see it's terrible. You no, know? it's your fault. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, nobody taking responsibility, and God just wanted to bless both of them. Um, so like I say neither, neither one of them accepting responsibility. Uh, let's skip down to verse sixteen. Um, and, and Hagar, and Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Um, and so he was 86 years old um, when he had Ishmael. Um, Ishmael is the father uh, of the Arabs today. And, and of course, the, the, the covenant, I don't know, we'll get to all of it tonight. Goes to talk about you know uh, about how that they will always be at each other, and of course we have people you know working for the peace of Jerusalem and the peace of the Middle East, and of course we are supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but the Bible tells us it will always be this way, mm -hmm. always be at each other. Um, the Arabs will always act the way they're acting now. Mm -hmm. uh, they will always hate the Jews. There will always be dissension, and this is why. Um, there's just a lot of there's just a lot of tension over there. I just wish our politicians would just read the Bible. <laughs> no. There'd be a whole lot of things that they would figure out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Genesis 17, 1. Here we are. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And look at this. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Thirteen years later. God spoke to Abram again at age 99. There are a lot of explanations for this. People think that because Abram was disobedient to God and went in and slept with Hagar, that he that he that he short-circuited God's plan and had to wait for the for things to work around again. You know, so 13 years later, God's still saying to him, "I don't believe that. I don't believe it for a minute. I believe that that uh, Abram could have had a son back in Genesis 12." If you wanted one, and I'm going to tell you why, and it's, and it's contained right in here. This is not in your notes, uh, but this is my my version of it. And when verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 1, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. What's he really saying to him, Abram? Straighten up. Believe what I'm saying. Let's go. So how is he? How is he not straightening up? Let's read on just a little bit. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, "As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee." Now I realize is is italicized and it's added, but you really don't need the verb. As for me, my covenant with thee. It's a now thing. Yeah. It's always been a now thing. So that's good. You know, God <coughs> said, "Let there be light." When the, when was there light? When God said, "There's light." Mm -hmm. You know. Then, uh, God, God's word never returns void to him. God has the thing when God says the thing. That's the way God operates. And he says, and he, and he says as for me, verse 4, my covenant is with thee. Can't talk now, I'm in class. Okay, call you back. Uh, we leave that on because sometimes Wilder calls us, but that was my son. As for me, behold my covenant with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. He's saying my covenant is now. Mm -hmm. But he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. So if he's saying my covenant is with me, with you, it's with you now, but he's always saying, also saying, straighten up. Yeah. Be thou perfect. Well, what's the problem? Verse 5, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee past tense. Now I'm going to skip some notes here on page 15. I'm just really going to go to what really is the crux of the issue here. With the problem with faith and the covenant and all this stuff being worked out. Where is Abram messing up? It has to do with God changing his name. Abram, if you do a word search, 
in the Strong's Concordance. <laughs> if you do a word search in there, just the name Abram, and you got to go to the name, and then you got to go to the root of the name and where this all comes from. Abram means fa- means high father. It's kind of like uh, a title. You know, it's a title of respect. High father, H I G H, high, you know, mm-hmm. high, mm-hmm. A- and, and elevated status is what mm-hmm. is what it means. Mm-hmm. Abraham <coughs> means father of multitude. I, don't, I was wondering. That's why, that's why he changed his name. And so what's Abram saying? So anywhere Abram goes, what's your name? My name's Abram. What do we know What do we know that faith does when we put it on the inside of us? What have we been talking about? What does faith do? It speaks. It talks. Is Abram saying the things that God's saying? Evidently not. If God has to say, in order for you to be perfect, we're going to have to change your name so that you will begin to say, mm. I am a father of a multitude. I am a father. Okay. See, okay, faith that speaks. And he remember. wasn't speaking. In fact, what was his complaint a few chapters previous to God? Why haven't you given me a son? Mm-hmm. I don't have a son. I don't have a son. I don't have an heir. Eleazar, one born in my house, not my own child is going to be my heir. I'm going to have to turn my stuff over to just somebody who works for me. Because I don't have an heir. What's he saying? I don't have an heir. I don't have an heir. I don't have the son. Sarah's barren. Sarai's barren. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I and and so finally God says, Stop. Mm-hmm. Let's get this thing right. Start mm-hmm. saying what I'm saying. I'm calling you a father of a multitude. I'm saying that, that your seed will be so many you can't number them unless you could number the sand of the sea or the stars of heaven. Mm-hmm. You know, he says that's what your seed's gonna be. Abram's not saying that. <coughs> And so he says, we're going to make it so you do say that. Mm -hmm. Now, one other thing's going on here. Um, Oh, I I don't want to quite get to that. Let me let me just read straight through. Verse six, and I will make thy I will make the exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. When will he do that? When he starts calling himself father of multitude. Verse 7, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee. Well, I will establish it. Why? Because you'll finally start saying what I'm saying. You'll finally start speaking faith words. Now, he believed him. He had it in his heart. It was counted to him for righteousness. But but Abram wasn't speaking faith. He was still speaking doubt and unbelief. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. He's, 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 he's saying everything he's always been saying, but Abraham, Abraham hadn't been saying it also. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, Thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. How is he going to do that? Because he's going to start talking it. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man shot among you shall be circumcised. Uh, what? How is a covenant ratified? Blood. And you all know what circumcision is. It's a surgical procedure in an area that we don't want to talk about surgical procedures. Okay. And we, we usually do this to children very shortly after they're born, male children. But they were doing it in Abram's 80s. A- Abram. 99 years, 99 years old. You're going to feel every bit of that. <laughs> He's going to remember it too. <laughs> yes. Well, and you shall circumcise, and every child among you shall be circumcised. So guess who else got circumcised? Ishmael and every male in their house. Yeah, they didn't do a lot for a while. And... and <laughs> And ye, in verse 11, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. Shedding of blood. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house and bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. Now we're all adults here. Why in the world would they cut blood there? What has to happen, children? That's kind of neat that they would cut blood. Mm-hmm. There, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, procreation is what this is all about. Yes. Let's have blood there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Mm. Uh, and he goes on to say, who will get to be circumcised? Verse 15. And God said to Abraham, 
as for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be, and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And said, As our shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? He still doesn't get it. <laughs> he still is not saying what God's saying. He's saying, he's still saying, No, this can't happen. Mm -hmm. Idiot. <laughs> now, and Abram said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee, his son from Hagar. And God said, Sarah, mm. not Sarai, interesting that he says that, and you'll see why in a minute. Thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. It's interesting, Isaac means laughter. And so because oh. they laughed at him, he oh, called God. their kid laughter. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Poor kid. Um, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. Twelve prisons shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, why I established with Isaac, which Sarah, not Sarai, and we'll come back to that in a minute, shall bear unto thee at this time in the next, at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him and God went up from Abraham. Abram was not saying what God said. And so he changed mm -hmm. his name to Abraham so that he would begin to say, I am the father of a multitude. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about where the covenant is cut, where the blood is shed, not an accident. It is the, mm -hmm. it is the anatomy of recreation. Mm -hmm. Okay, of creation, of procreation, sorry, procreation. It's the word I want. But remember I told you that Sarai is blessed also. The covenant's with her, too. If there's going to be seed of Abraham, yes. it's going to be through Sarai. Mm -hmm. And so he changes her name also. Well, why is that significant? Here's why it's significant, and you never hear this taught anywhere else. I love that, I love that God has shown me this. It has to get back with the Strong's Concordance <laughs> and doing a word study in the Strong's. Just like you can look up Abram and see that it means this elevated position of honor, mm -hmm. and Abraham means father of a multitude, Sarai means royalty. Mm. But, now we don't have this much in the English language, and I think this is why we miss this. Have you ever studied another language? Spanish, for, an, for instance, has masculine nouns and feminine nouns. Mm -hmm. El something, let's say child, Nino. El Nino is a boy child. La Nina is a, is a girl child, feminine and masculine in the nouns. We don't have that here. You know, we would just say girl or boy. Yeah. And, no, and of course, there's a gender associated with that. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Sarai means royalty. That's a great name. That's her name initially. Sarai is the masculine form of the word. Mm, mm. Mm. Now, oh, that's here good. again, we're all adults here, and hopefully in Wilder. But, <laughs> um, you know, we it takes man and woman mm -hmm. to make a child. And not only had Abram not been calling himself a father of a multitude, he had been calling his wife boy. She was barren. Matter of fact, her father had named her that. And he spoke the curse over her. Yes, that's exactly right, Daniel. Oh. He spoke the curse over her. He spoke barrenness over her. Sarah is the feminine of Sarai. Oh, wow. It means princess. Yeah, it means mm -hmm. princess. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. See, see, Sarai means royalty, but one's the feminine, mm -hmm. one's the masculine. And so God changed Abraham's name so that he would say, I am a father of a multitude. And he changed Sarai's name so that she would be female. Mm -hmm. And that's what it took. And then when you get down to, I think it's verse 21, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac and with Sarah, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And people have said, well, that set time means back when Abram was 75, God wasn't going to do it then. 
he knew the set time was when he was 99. No, the set time has to, has to do with the fact that it takes nine months to make a baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the set time. He, and he said the set time is in this time next year. <coughs> You know, and so, you know, I've changed things. Abraham, you're now going to call yourself what you're supposed to be calling yourself. That's Sarah good. is now fully woman, and mm -hmm. so it's only going to take nine months to get a baby here. Mm -hmm. Because we've fixed those things, those areas where you have not been in agreement with me. Um, now, part C of page 15. During his 25-year struggle to be in faith, Abraham had heard the covenant stated at least nine times. God did speaking confession what we are supposed to do. Abram was in all kinds of delay. God continued to confess, continued to confess, continued to speak his word, continued to speak his word. Abram was dragging his feet, but God kept talking it, talking it, talking it, talking it. Okay? That's how you state that's how you state faith. So God's doing confession just like we're supposed to do confession. Um Let's read it. Part D, page 15. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Faith, we know what faith is now, how we get it, how it operates, that it might be by grace, which is God's power. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. So it's faith and God's power. It's a promise. They None of us work to it. It's something that's given to us. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. Remember I told you, God, Abraham and faith came before the law. Abraham, who is the father of us all, the father of faith, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. That's what God had said to him. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead, the deadness of Sarah's womb. How did he do it? He changed what she said. That brought life. He changed what she said. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. What were the things that were not? No kids. But called them. Abraham is a father of a multitude. Sarah is all female, no longer barren, capable of bearing children, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. He believed God. He operated in faith. It just, he was a slow learner. It just took him a while to get there. And finally God had to say, Hey, here's the deal. Quit saying what you've been saying. Start saying my word. I will tell you, there was a day when I was in extreme poverty. It's the way we live. Uh, if you hang around church very long, you'll have to hear Ta Pastor Pat talk about it. He mentioned it sometimes. Um, God began to have me find things in the word to say. Blessing scriptures. And I began to say them. But right at the same time, something else he had me to do was he said, Frank, quit cursing your finances. Quit saying you can't make money doing this or you can't make money doing that. Quit saying the wrong things and say the right things. Uh, that's how it works. Point E. Once God's man or woman gets into a position of faith, and this is a good thing. I really have not taught this very much mm -hmm. on faith, but this is a good point. Once God's man or woman gets into a position of faith, God forgets all that it took to get him, him or her there. You know, we see that Abraham is screwing up all along the way. You know, not saying the right things. Sarah laughs. Abraham laughs. They don't. They didn't. Neither one of them believe that God's really going to do this. There, you know, and proof of that is that you know they have Ishmael by Hagar. You know, why would you do that? Well, we really don't know how God's going to do this. We're not sure God's going to do this. We'd better help God. Mm -hmm. And then and then finally God has to say, will you please quit speaking doubt and unbelief and start speaking words of faith. And so, but finally when they get there and Isaac is born, they're operating in faith and everything before that is forgotten, which is really kind of how God deals with, with us in sin anyway. You know, once we're under the blood, we're under the blood. Point one, 
God blots out the remembrance of doubt and unbelief just as he blots out the remembrance of sin when one is saved. There's no difference. There's no difference. We're so, we're so quick to be able to believe God for the salvation message of Jesus and get cleansed by the blood, but we, we lock up on faith. Uh, and God forgets all our stupid actions that are doubt and unbelief just as easily as he forgets all our stupid actions that caused us to be lost. Um, Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. He doesn't blot it out. You know, it's just, it's, God knows we're a mess. Yes. You know, and he does not forgive us for our sake. He forgives us because he loves us, but he forgives us because of his own name. Yeah. I'm God. I am the God that forgives, and so in order to be true to my word, and so that my reputation is not soiled, he says, I'm going to save you. Yes, glory. My own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Hebrews 8, 12, <coughs> I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Point two, God is merciful to us. Yes. Just as Jesus was merciful to the man in Mark 9, 24, who said, Lord, I believe. Glory. Help my unbelief. What was he saying? Help me in the areas where I'm not in faith. This is not a salvation issue. You know, this is not a, a eternal address, going to heaven when you die issue. This is a faith issue. And the same mercy that applies to being forgiven of our sins so that we can go to heaven will work in faith also. When we're trying to stand in unbelief, and if you realize you're in, your un, you're in unbelief, the man said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, and he did. You know, God knows what I, what, I have to look that up in, in uh, Corinthians, for we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Maybe I can, maybe I can put a crystal of four. Is that what that is? Verse six. You know, that's good for you. <laughs> yeah, Second Corinthians four. Henry says it's Second Corinthians four. First, that sounds about the right place. Seven. Um, well, let's go six. For, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure mm. in earthen vessels. Look at this. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. See, we can't claim any of the good things. That's why it said, um, Isaiah 43, 25, I will blot out your transgressions for my own sake. You can't, you can't, we can't claim it. But here's the thing. Mercy is what causes God to be able to do that. And God's mercy works also in faith. Okay. Um, we have made it to page 17, section 2. We will begin there next week. Uh, remember, if you do not have notes, you can get those by contacting Andrea here at Family Worship Center uh, in, in Carrollton. She has all that together. Um, Henry, I'm going to borrow your pen. Uh, Wilder, you've been silent there. Um, or maybe this, is this this week. And so Danielle's here. Yeah, that one stopped working. Okay, uh, thank you. And Jeanette, Janet's here, and Henry's here. Um, see you next week.